Hi, I'm Pam Bailey. I am host of Voices Unlocked, a podcast produced by More Than Our Crimes, and we're dedicated to bringing the humanity behind bars um, out to you. Uh, We focus on the federal prisons. And um, there was a a report that just came out uh, from the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, and they sent a team sort of unannounced to inspect a medium security prison in Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, the, the headline findings is they found prisoners being served moldy bread. They found uh, bugs crawling in boxes of cereal in the kitchen. They went to the warehouse where they stored food. And they found spoiled and rotten food in all the containers. Um, and, you know, that sounds terrible. I, I talked to a friend who read the same report, and she's, she was appalled. And I'd like to be able to say that that was an unusual finding, and it's actually not. Um, I hear it from members of our network all the time. And there was actually also a report that came out, um, I think about two years ago, from a group called Impact Justice. And they focused on food specifically. And they actually called food a form of hidden punishment. It's used as punishment by the prison system. Um, So that's what we're going to be focusing on in this episode today is prison food. And my co-host is Irving Brockman. Um, you've uh, spent about 30 years in prison, released in 2020. Mm. And I'd like to sort of, when I say prison food to you, what comes to mind? The first thing that comes to mind is thank God that it's over with. <laughs> uh, disgust. Um, and mo- for most of the time that I spent, in the, especially in the federal system, uh, getting a hot meal or food that was cooked properly, uh, that was hard to come by. And I guess for uh, most of us, you couldn't wait until you know uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas or one of the major holidays when most of the staff would be there to eat the food as well. So that's when you know that it's gonna be cooked properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but every day, the everyday meals, uh, most of the times you walk into the kitchen and, and you immediately turn around. I would eat a, rather eat a Roman noodle soup and some crackers than go in there and eat what they have in the kitchen. Um, sometimes, uh, if you can picture like soup uh, that they have on a hot bar, it looks like uh, when I was a kid, I used to go down the country and the food they used to prepare for the hogs and all the stuff to be mixed in. That's how I look. Mm. You know, mm. it's a bunch of beans, rice, and stuff that was left over from the day before. Uh, beans are uncooked. Yeah. Uh, rice is uncooked, uh, partially cooked. Uh, you go in there for some grilled cheese. You know, the days that they may have grilled cheese, the, the bread is warm and the cheese is cold. <laughs> uh, you know, the juice, that even the juice, like I've seen that juice spill out on the floor. And then when you just go to wipe it up, like that's that stain is never coming up off the floor. So just imagine what it does to your insides. Mm. Yeah, it's sad because food is really one of the pleasures of life, if you think about it, uh, for mm. all of us. Um, one of the individuals I interviewed for the show his name is Elijah Williams. He's from um, a high security penitentiary in called Victorville in California. Mm-hmm. And what you're going to hear in his first interview bite um, is uh, he focuses on the small portion sizes. This is probably one of the things I hear the most mm-hmm. from network members. And I think may be surprising to a lot of our listeners who sort of assume that people are at least getting enough food to, to get by them. But keep in mind, in this case, we're talking about a prison of adult men you know, who have, have appetites. And uh, I, I often hear that people, if you don't, if you can't go to the commissary, the prison store, to buy extra food, you'll, you'll be hungry. So this is what Elijah talks about. We are undernourished because of the simple fact that we only get maybe 1,200 calories, sometimes nine, and that's with all three meals that you might want to put together, especially if you got to eat from boxes and box lunches and stuff like that, because some of them, you know, meats or something like that, they're, they're not edible. Um, 
So you just have to just put it away and, you know, just throw it away in the garbage or whatever, something like that. So then now you only got bread, apple, and you may have peanut butter, um, which is one of the favorites. They kind of like, you know, push that out there quite often. The other thing is they have a tendency of doing long lockdowns. And during these long lockdowns, you, you know, you're not going to the store. We had went one time this year. 13 weeks without going to the store, without buying anything. So that when you had to eat whatever they gave you. And what they gave you was not, you know, some of it wasn't editable, like I tell you. Um, it's difficult because you get very, very small portions. You got grown men in here. And, you know, you got some men that are bigger than others. And, you know, they need their food. People lose weight all the time. If they took a survey and see how many people lost weight here, it would be a, a huge amount of people that has lost weight this year alone. So Elijah just mentioned he, he refers to sometimes getting a box or a bag meal. And I think probably most people, when they think of prison, if you look because of the shows you've seen on TV or something, they think of these big cafeterias or chow halls that people go to. So maybe talk a little bit about... Um, you know, when do you go to a, a chow or a cafeteria versus, I guess, maybe during lockdowns, you end up getting bags or something? So uh, I think the, for me, I was in USP Beaumont at one time, and that was the first institution that I went to where you stay locked down a lot. It was always, uh, Beaumont had a nickname called uh, Bloody Beaumont. Mm. So it was always something happening on that. Uh, compound and you get locked down. Uh, in 2005, I'll never forget, uh, I got down to Beaumont in May 2005. And later that year is when uh, the hurricane had hit Texas. And we was locked in the cells uh, maybe two weeks. We had no running water. Uh, and the food that we was getting were, you know, every day was the same bologna. Or tur I mean, the meat smelled so bad, like, you know, but you you almost, like, you have to eat it because there's nothing, you know, you, you there's no commissary, mm -hmm. it was nothing. So you have to, you literally have to just choke down this meat that the color of it was... <laughs> Uh, gray green. Um, yeah, <laughs> the smell of it was it was horrible. It was horrible, and you know the and this is something that they they hand out to you even you know on regular lockdowns. So uh, going to the cafeteria was more of a uh, compared to lockdowns was definitely a benefit. Uh, the size of the meals that they give you, uh, I recall several times that there was uh, fights in the kitchen about the portions that would, you know, be given to you for like, you know, you feeding grown men and you yeah. giving me one spoon of, uh, of rice or one spoon of potatoes, you know, um, you get count seven fries on your tray. You know, sometimes we, you know, we make a bet like. I bet you don't get more than 10 fries on that tray. Yeah. You know, uh, and during my entire time incarcerated, I stayed under 200 pounds. Uh, well, up until I got near to getting out and uh, I came home and I gained 60 pounds in no time. You know, like, I mean, the food is just totally different. You know, the taste, uh, the smell, you, you'll never forget it. You'll never so the, forget so it. So the bags, when you're locked down, yes. the, the, you'll be fed food in a box or a bag or something A box like or a bag. Some yeah. institutions have boxes. Some institutions have bags. But they all had the same thing. Uh, I don't know how many institutions, but I know mainly for like from the Midwest uh, out to the West Coast, they give you this bag of water. And you can smell the water, mm. like smell. I mean, the water that it smells stale. Like mm. this, this water is. Uh, I can't even describe it. it. It's inside of a bag, 
And you know, most of the times the milk come in the same bag and most of the times the milk is spoiled. Uh, but this water, it, the water, uh, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. And, but you know, you have to drink it, you have to drink it. Well, I have a friend who just got out of prison. He was a, a government whistleblower. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he told me when he got out, and he actually just wrote a column about this that he published, uh, was when he was in the kitchen, he actually saw crates of food that were labeled not for human consumption. It was basically meant as as, uh, as animal feed, <laughs> and they were actually using it in the kitchen. And it sounds shocking, but if you, if you read this report from Tallahassee, you realize that now this actually happens all the time. Um, so I, one of the other people that I interviewed for this episode um, that we've featured before, his name is Askia Africa Burr. That's his sort of that's the name he's taken in prison. And he's at um, a penitentiary called McCreary in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And he talks a little bit about um, how it's actually pretty routine to have, you know, f uh, fruit, for instance, that's really on the edge of, of being bad. Mm -hmm. And that's what their idea of fruit is. So let, let's, let's listen to him. Yes, I've had encountered rotten fruit, particularly rotten fruit. They give you fruit that's rotten. You know, uh, bananas and apples that are already practically gone bad, you know, it's only parts of it, little small portions of it that you can eat. But I'll say this, the food is either lukewarm or it's cold. You never receive a hot meal. You know, that's that's the thing right there. The food that you're gonna get is gonna just be cold. If you get your oatmeal or your grits in the morning, they're gonna be cold, clumped together, stuck together where it's not an enjoyable meal. Well you know one thing we just heard from Askia and I hear this a lot, is a complaint about not getting a hot meal. They want at least one hot meal a day. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the psychological importance. I mean, there's, there's the fact that some food is meant to be served hot and also just like getting bologna or cold food all the time. Um, what's the importance? What do you remember? Why does that stick out in your head, not getting a hot meal? Uh, for me, uh, for most of the people that complain about not getting hot meals, most of the times that's because you're in an institution that stays locked down. And a lot of times the, the lockdowns are unjustified for the amount of time that they keep us locked down. And there are policies that, you know, after 70, the, you know, every 72 hours that we should, we should be allowed to have, or we should have a hot meal, right? Uh, most institutions honor it. No, let me rephrase that. Some institutions are honored, and most don't. So, uh, you know, as I said, I was in uh, USP Beaumont, where we went, it was on lockdown, for, I think, for maybe three months at one time for, uh, for a, a homicide, and uh, maybe we received two hot meals during that time. And I think your body kind of craves something that it's used to. You know, if you're used to eating something that's hot, then you go to eating, you know, just cold food, and, you know, throughout a long period of time. Uh, it doesn't, you know, I guess it has something to do with the way you digest the food or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, all of the food is bad, but I would rather eat it hot mm -hmm. than eat it cold. You know, uh, it, it, it even smells worse when it's cold. So. And it sounds like it's like peanut butter and bologna, peanut butter and bologna. <laughs> like when you're getting those, these bag lunches. I would, like, but, you know, I would rather have the peanut butter uh, over the bologna yeah. because the bologna is, you know, like I say, the the meat, oh, I wish you could see some of the, you know, some of the photographs of the <laughs> the meat that they serve us when we on lockdown. Like the the color of the meat. I've never seen meat that color before. You know, in the interview that is coming up, you're going to be hearing him. Uh, was, he talks about the fact that he wanted to take pictures. <laughs> he he knew if they would just let him take pictures of the food, people would understand, and they wouldn't let him do that. They wouldn't let him send uh, pictures out. Well, um, the next person who's talking is Wallace Mitchell. He is from Beaumont. You, you were talking about yeah. Beaumont. He's from there. And the, the, actually, the rest of the individuals um, who you will hear are from Beaumont. In Texas, and um, the next uh, Wallace talks about your particular trouble if, let's say, you have a health condition um, that requires special foods, like maybe you have high blood pressure, and you should stay away from processed foods or highly salty foods or something like that. And the prison really doesn't cater to that, so that's what he talks about next. 
virtually everything you get is processed. If you're one of those persons who's trying to avoid processed foods, that's going to be complicated. Also, I've noticed that allergens are hard. To people, people that are allergic to nuts, allergic to soy. Soy is in almost everything now, and particularly in prison foods, even in the commissary, right? So people have a, they're allergic to soy, right? This is very bad for them. So it's just, that's not good. They're not going to have much to select from. So the next interview is from Tyrone Briscoe. Um, he's also at Beaumont. Um, and he, you're going to hear that he's really disgusted with the food. And um, he, he says what I've heard from a lot of the guys who, um, who sort of wonder where the money is going. They know that, that all the prisons get, uh, they're, they're supposed to have guidelines for nutrition and they get a certain budget and so where it's going. And they sort of speculate that some of the food, the good food is being you know, brought home by the staff. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's, it's a common it's common thinking. Um, and so we'll hear from Tyrone, and, and this is the, this is the soundbite that I mentioned where he says that if he could just they would just let him take pictures and send pictures out of the food that was that would uh, say more than we could in words. You, you'd look at the pictures and you'd know the food was bad. So this is Tyrone. Right now, we don't even know what we're eating. It's watered down. It's garbage. The bureau is worth eight billion dollars. There's no way that they could be worth eight billion dollars if we feed them like this. In the seventies, in the eighties, if you look at the food, and somebody says in the nineties, the food was all right. Right now, we don't know what we eat. Why is we eating like this? I asked them, let me take a picture of the food for seven days. They won't do it. <laughs> so I can send it to the Turn No Fairs. That way you will see what, what we eat. If they let me take a picture, I'll pay for it myself. It's been done before, but they they won't let me do it. Yeah. So the it, only way that you will know how to fool up, I got to take a picture of it. Yeah, I we know. Wake up, we wake up, we wake up and get a cereal, a little pastry fit in your hand, uh, some powdered milk, and an apple. We've been getting an apple for going on four months. You can't get more than that as a Happy Meal. So the next thing that Wallace, we're going back to um, Wallace, um, that he talks about at Beaumont too is the one sort of bright spot when they're allowed to go to the commissary. Now, one thing I'm hearing about repeatedly is sometimes for uh, punishment, a collective punishment, if there's like a fight between two people, um, the entire unit gets their commissary privileges taken away. Mm -hmm. So this stops that. That means they have to rely only on prison food. So now you know why that's a punishment. But when they can go to the commissary, um, they've gotten really creative of taking the items they can buy in the prison store and making these really um, elaborate um, recipes, desserts and, and pizzas and all sorts of things. And usually there's somebody on the unit who becomes known as being a really good cook. And he's one of them. And he, he gives an example of, of one recipe he makes for pizza. So let's, let's listen. We have developed what are known as prison recipes for multiple different things that we do with food, right? For example, we've learned how to make pizza virtually from scratch. We take crackers, honey buns, and we flatten them out with makeshift rolling pins, which could be anything that's round, it could be deodorant or whatever, right? Into a dough, we our pizza dough, we cut up uh, sausages and different vegetables and things into that, right? And then uh, we heat it with open fire that we make out of toilet paper rolls. What we do is we roll toilet paper into these things that we call bombs, right? And uh, and we light them, and it causes it to burn with a blue flame, which is probably no blue flame burns harder than red flame, right? And we put it either in our lockers or in our metal tables, which makes it like a makeshift oven or a makeshift grill, and that's how we're able to cook things. Okay, so the one thing I was wondering, and I forgot to ask him during the interview, he talks in that bite we just heard about how they, they created their own fire using toilet paper rolls. And what I was trying to figure out, and I think maybe a lot of our listeners and viewers are wondering, well, they don't have matches. They don't allow matches in prison. So how, how do they actually create a flame? Well, you can take a uh, AA battery, and what you do is you uh, like shave off the side of the AA battery and you get a piece of uh, aluminum, like a little strip of aluminum from a- uh, Like foil or something? Or? Yeah, okay. foil from maybe the Goya pack or whatever. And you 
put one side on a positive and you take the other part and you touch it to the the shave side of the battery and you put it up on the toilet paper and that's how it, it, it'll get hot and it'll oh. flame up. Um, so the prison system has been trying to get do away with batteries because oh. of that. Uh, but it seems like they will find a way around it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just really impressed by the creativity um, that, that, that they do to create these social moments with, with food. Do you remember from your time in prison, like were you one of those people that was a, known as a really good cook or do you remember somebody on your unit that was really good at making cakes or something? Well, <laughs> there was a few people uh, that I remember because uh, I know when I came home, I wanted to, I had a craving for cheesecake. So there was a lot of guys that I know uh, that knew how to make cheesecake and they would make cheesecakes uh, with the graham crackers, uh, it's graham crackers. The uh, it was a mixture of stuff that they would make, and it, I mean it, they be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they be good, and I was like, oh, "This is what a cheesecake tastes like." I can't wait to find out what a you know <laughs> to come home and and you know get an actual cheesecake. But them they be good. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. why I'm just really impressed. Uh, you know. Uh, even though the prison takes away certain things, like things with sugar in it, because you can make alcohol out of it, but there's a way around it, and I think that's that to me is um, a sign of hope. You know, that people where there's a will is a way, and they'll recreate mm. a little bit of home in prison. The other one is nachos, so guys can make. I mean, I know some guys that can make really good nachos. They, I mean, they should be out here making mm -hmm. money off those nachos that they make in prison. I'd like to try that. So in the next uh, bite, we're going back to Wallace, and he talks about um, these people who are so good at cooking actually have turned it into um, a, a side hustle, an actual business, especially because like it's, it's really hard to get prison jobs, so it's a way to generate some income. People like me, I'm, I'm what's known as one of the institution cooks. I can cook in the unit. I can take the bare necessities and make meals for men. And what it comes down to is this. All of us out in the, in the free world become accustomed to certain foods and things that we know, right? Some people use it to make money. It becomes what's called their hustle, their source of income or supplementing their income, right? Some people give it away. Uh, you might have, you have different, various different gray, uh, groups in prison, uh, gangs, geographical locations, religious groups, right? Uh, everyone runs with a certain group of people, right? And so you might make something for your group. You might be celebrating something. Know, for your for your particular group or something it might be a religious holiday or something to that effect right there right and so you might put together a meal for you know the people in that group and so you spend your time up to that day everybody collecting and saving stuff chipping in and then you start making the meal the day before the celebration so i just came back not too long ago from an international prison reform conference in belgium and i found it both discouraging and inspiring Discouraging in that the U.S. is way behind, <laughs> um, but inspiring in that um, hearing what some other places are doing. And one of the things they talked about was food. And there's a number of Western European prisons that are now allowing prisoners to officially do their own cooking, not on this surreptitiously on the side. They actually have a kitchen where um, prisoners are uh, for each unit where they actually are, you know, can go in, I mean, with, with knives and, you know, everything. <laughs> I know, right? And, and they, uh, they, they partner with local suppliers. So they you have like local farmers, you know, so they're bringing in fresh vegetables that, and there's some choice involved. They're not like dictated to in terms of what you have to make. Um, and it's actually working out really well. Um, it's, it comes a real social time, you know, for the, for the, for the men uh, to cook together. Um, and it's a, it's a privilege that they really like, so they, they do what they have to do to, to maintain it, and it's healthier. Um, they actually have found, they're doing a study, and they don't have the results in yet, to, to watch like the kind of um, health benefits of having fresh vegetables. Um, and so I, that's, that's a sign that other people are recognizing the importance of food, mm -hmm. and maybe the U.S. can get to that sometime in the future. So on that inspiring note, we're going to end this episode I hope that everybody out there will um, follow, subscribe uh, to the podcast so you'll see future episodes and share it with your friends. Thank you. <laughs>